So here's a little information about the context and the format of today's evening. This is a gigantic topic. We only have about an hour and 15 minutes, even less time than that now. And so there's no way we're going to be able to deal with all aspects of immigration comprehensively. Immigration is going to be the dominant issue that we'll hear about until the 2018 elections and beyond. So the 2018 election year, in many ways, will be a story about immigration. We already had a government shutdown very closely tied to it, and we're only 36 days into the year. And so um, I hope that you will walk away from this event, maybe not having made up your mind about a bunch of the issues or feeling like you're an expert on them, but at least have some facts and context to bring forward in the many discussions you'll be having ahead. So our goal is to provide facts and context, not to persuade you to think a certain way. Um, so the format of our discussion is going to be sort of like Mythbusters or Snopes, where you hear a statement and then our panelists are going to tell you fact, fiction, or maybe some sort of mixed answer. And so we came up with 12 statements that are commonplace around immigration debates, and our panelists are going to, to dive into those. We will have time for some questions at the end, but our time is limited. And so to make our time as efficiently as possible, we place note cards around the room. How many of you have a note card that you see? So if you have a question that you would like the panelists to address, please write that question on a note card and just raise your hand in the air with it and somebody will come by and pick it up and then one of our student leaders is going to talk um, at the end and go through some of those questions. We won't be able to get to everybody's question, that's just an admission in advance, but we will have time to read those questions aloud to the group. All right, so without um, further ado, let's turn to our first question. And this question is to Professor Matthews and that statement is America has a long history with immigration, fact, fiction. Um, that would definitely be a, a fact. Uh, I think everybody knows the United States bills itself as a nation that is one of immigrants. Um, but as such, I think there's a bit more context we need to talk about there historically, uh, thinking about what that actually means. It, you know, one thing that's, um, you know, that, 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 that we see over time is that immigration and immigration policy more specifically has been a long contentious uh, issue in American politics and a, and, a, and a sort of deeply divisive battleground. Uh, we see a pattern where a generation who uh, maybe traces its ancestry farther back uh, blames a, a newer generation of migrants for particular social, economic, or political, or cultural ills uh, that they may see facing the nation. And we see this in the 1840s uh, with the Irish and the Know Nothing movement in the 1880s with the Chinese and the Exclusion Act, uh, variously with Poles and Jews and Italians at the turn of the century. Um, so that is nothing new. Um, also, just in, in, in historical context, and answering that question is another phenomenon. Because immigration is such a contentious topic, because it, it's going to, you know, whatever decision is made about immigration is going to affect the nation 15, 10, 15 years down the road in the makeup of the nation and affect voting and affect how resources are allocated and so on and so forth, um, that these become uh, contentious issues. And one thing that we've seen historically, not only in the United States, but in Western Europe more generally, is when you see a rise of an authoritarian right-wing movement of some sort or another, we, we see that a common phenomenon is marginalization and scapegoating of marginalized communities. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think we can see that with the Muslim ban, with the talk of the wall, the, the rhetoric around uh, gangs, uh, and, and, and so, you know, using words like chain migration and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, provides a, a little bit of historical context in, in answering a fairly uh, complicated question. But yes, of course, the United States is a nation of immigrants, but that is, uh, make, makes the immigration issue all the more contentious. Professor Carew, perhaps you could provide some more um, context on those lines. So fact or fiction, political debate about immigration is nothing new. Certainly. Uh, this is also very clearly a uh, fact. Um, and kind of along the lines of what Dr. Matthews is talking about here, we have these issues where um, sometimes we feel more kindly towards immigration and sometimes we don't. Um, and sometimes we try to uh, place ourselves into a positive light, historically speaking, in order to make ourselves feel as though we have um, always been welcoming to immigrants, right? So if you think about um, the New Colossus, right, and the, the um, poem that is written that is on the base or, you know, connected with the base for the Statue of Liberty, right, um, you know, give me your tired, your poor, um, your huddled masses, right? Uh, and this makes us feel as though we can look back and say that we've been um, a nation that is kindly towards immigrants, but as Dr. Matthews indicated, many of the people that were coming in 
um, at that time were seen in an extremely negative light and were being pushed to actually leave. Um, and so we have these ebbs and flows of, nativ of nativist and xenophobic uh, rhetoric and attitudes that um, kind of flow throughout our political debate concerning um, immigration, but particularly not just debate, but policy as well. Right. So um, we can look to, let's say, the, the 1800s, where we have many um, Chinese railroad workers who have come in, who are doing the work of the nation, but then we work to exclude them, right? And we create these policies of exclusion. Um, and so we have, uh, I guess you could then also say the same in terms of uh, the Great Depression and all of the blaming of um, perceived immigrant communities. Uh, being shipped off by the millions into Mexico in the 1930s for repatriation, uh, when really probably about half of those individuals who were, um, I guess I guess you can't call it shipped, but trained um, into central Mexico, were actually born in the United States, right? Um, and so they had US citizenship. I mean, we have since then apologized for this, um, but apologies don't really do a whole lot in terms of people's life chances, right? Um, and so we have these ebbs and flows that um, are partially based on the business and political imperatives that come up against the ways in which um, kind of average citizens perceive these issues, right? So there's this pull in terms of um, business desire for labor often but then a push back against that in order for people to have a scapegoat. And so that's why we end up with these strange um, and contentious debates. Great, thank you. Professor Sheridan, our next fact or fiction statement is probably a little harder to give a one uh, clear directional answer, but immigrants hurt the U.S. economy. Oh no, I can be clear. Uh, Good. 95 to 100 percent fiction. Um, so if you're an, if you're an immigration uh, skeptic, let's say, and if your skepticism is rooted in fears that uh, immigrants somehow are bad for the economy, um, let me put your mind at ease. Opposing immigration on the basis of economic grounds is um, misguided, I would say, um, at best. So let me just let me mention three things. So the first thing when people think about with immigrants and the economy is typically, um, that they steal jobs from Americans, right? So the immigrants, they take our jobs, um, and so they're bad, and, and we should get rid of them. Um, so let's know, there's a, we have a term for this. It's called the lump of labor fallacy, which is the idea that somehow there's this fixed amount of jobs, and if an immigrant comes over and is employed, that must have been a job that was taken away from somebody else. Um, but that's entirely inaccurate, and so to see how, um, if if it was true that we only had a fixed amount of jobs that were available out there, that would be really, really bad news for you because when you graduate, right, you're hoping to find a job. You're not just gonna steal a job from somebody else, are you? Probably not, right? There's, you know, you create demand um, for, for goods and services just like, uh, just like immigrants do. So that would be the first thing. Um, the second is if you break down immigration into, let's say, high skill and low skill immigration, um, the case is much more clear cut for high skill immigration. Um, net bene net uh, benefit for society and the economy um, as a whole. Just a few quick hitters uh, for that. Uh, immigrants are twice as likely to receive a patent. They're 30% more likely to start a business. Um, Let's see, uh, estimated if you, um, so there was a proposal a few years ago to raise the H-1B visa cap, um, and that proposal was estimated over, the, over a 10-year time period to add about $450 billion to the economy. That's the most clear-cut case. Now, where it gets a little bit more um, unclear is with low-skill immigration. So low-skill immigration um, is, is a tougher case to make, but there's not any evidence, any strong evidence to suggest that it hurts native workers. Okay, so I want to make sure I state that clearly. There's not really any strong evidence that uh, low-skill immigrants, so those with, let's say, a high school education or less, that those hurt native workers um, or American workers that have the same level uh, of skill. Um, and I could point to some studies um, and give you some more statistics on there, but I know that we have uh, a limited amount of time. So, so I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it at that, and I can take questions if you have them later. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Up next, Professor Reynolds. The statement for fact or fiction is immigrants choose to be here in violation of the law. Fact, but that is because the law is exclusionary. 
So the history of immigration law isn't meant to include more people into the United States, but rather to exclude people from the United States. Immigrants are here for family unity, for economic and employment opportunities, for safety, refugees and asylees who fear persecution. Um, however, the US immigration law has a history of deciding which people should not be here and therefore making it unlawful for certain people to be in the United States. Um, there's family-based and employment-based categories for permanent residency, which leads to a path to citizenship. And there's other categories, such as the diversity lottery and refugees and asylees. So yes, there are a lot of people who choose to be here in violation of the law, but that is because the law is in serious need of reform. Even people who come here to, for family unity or are seeking family unity, there are quotas on the number of employment petitions every year, on the number of family-based petitions every year. There's a quota on based on countries. And um, even if you do qualify for a visa, there are such severe backlogs that you could be waiting more than 20 years for your visa to become available. Great, thank you. So now we'll move to round two of our fact or fiction and starting back with Professor Matthews. The fact or fiction statement is, the U.S. has historically been soft on immigration. Um, where did that answer go? Uh, the U.S. has been historically soft on immigration. That would be, uh, oh, I do have that. Uh, that would be, let me, let me think. I didn't think of this as, as a way of, I always want to overcomplicate things. Uh, I guess the U.S. has been soft on immigration uh, in, uh, in particular moments in history, uh, but for the most part, uh, it has not been soft on immigration. What I, it, it seems counterintuitive, but to say that it's soft on immigration, uh, we did not have a border wall, for example, until 1924 uh, or so. Uh, before that, it's been an open border. Uh, Mexicans uh, and Americans along the border where the border shifted after uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo where the United States fought an aggressive war against Mexico that took half of Mexico's national territory. Um, uh, that since that shift that the border shifted on, on people living there and until the 1920s there was really zero border enforcement and really until World War II there was very little border enforcement. Um, so in that regard if you think of that as being soft on immigration absolutely. Um, uh, so you know that, that's a one sort of historical way of thinking about it. Uh, the other thing I would also uh, think about is that if we look at um, you know another a period where you could say the U.S. was soft on immigration uh, during World War II, when there was a need for labor in the United States, uh, we introduced the Bracero program, where Mexican immigrants were brought into the United States to work uh, as laborers. Uh, they stayed here until about 1964. Uh, and did, you know, and, and were invited in, but once, um, you know, the political climate shifted in the 1960s, there began to be a push against uh, uh, that policy and a shift towards a harder stance on immigration. And people that had been invited into the country and who had worked legally uh, through the Bracero program everywhere but Texas uh, were, were then, uh, you know, asked to leave. And, 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 and so we see a shift there. And I think if we look at something like the Bracero program, we see this sort of moment between what we sometimes define as soft or um, hard stances on immigration. And again, this is totally a, 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 a answer that refuses to take a, to say yes or no, because I think it's all about context uh, and understanding um, you know, how, how, how we define soft and, and hard and on immigration, and then realize that the, the, the needs of the nation often uh, shift accordingly. So that's what I'll say about that. So it's a mixed answer. So thank yes. you, <clears throat> Professor Matthews. Yes and no. Up next, Professor Carew with a question that is going to be dominating headlines for months ahead. Yeah. Passing DACA legislation in Congress would be easy. Uh, you know, if I could change the wording to should be easy, right, I could say that it would be fact, right? But this is um, clearly fiction. Um, and there's some ways that we, or it's a myth, right, that this, this is going to be really easy. Um, and we can see this in, in a variety of ways. One, um, in that uh, we... That in terms of DACA, right, that President Obama had to engage in or found that he had to engage in this particular executive action um, in spite of encouraging uh, some sort of legislative uh, movement for some sort of comprehensive, comprehensive immigration bill. Um, the fact that he then said, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to do what I can within the purview of my abilities, right? I can't give um, some sort of 
um, legal status in terms of citizenship, but I can grant some sort of legal status with regards to um, making sure that you're not immediately pushed out, right? You get pushed kind of to the back of the line with regards to deportation, right? Um, and so the fact that uh, prior to that there had not been new bills coming in, and after that we still have not seen new bills moving forward in a, in a way that um, is definitive, we can say that this is something that's clearly a difficult issue, right? Even if we look back, I guess, five months now, and we say that we know right, that this program is going to kind of officially um, be wiped off, right, of the um, executive agenda, we can see that Congress still hasn't done anything on it yet, right? It hasn't actually moved forward in a way that is definitive. And so um, that should tell us something about the difficulties here. Um, some of this has to do with the fact that um, there are some very powerful, smaller interests that are able to mobilize uh, people in order to put pressure on political actors um, in order to oppose something that currently, at least in terms of a DREAM Act, um, the vast majority of Americans support, right? So anywhere from about 70% to 85% of Americans say that they support some sort of policy that is in favor of dreamers, right? But we're not seeing movement that we would expect in some sort of representative democracy in that direction, right? And so part of that has to do with some of the powers that are able to engage in mobilization. Um, and so it should be. Um, easy, but it's a very difficult situation. And we, the closest that we got was 2006 in terms of uh, comprehensive immigration reform where the Senate passed a bill that seemed relatively reasonable for the time. Um, and the House, I guess you could say, luckily did not get to pass its bill in terms of um, some of the pushback with regards to mobilization of Latinx communities um, against the ways in which those policies were, were formulated. Thank you, Professor Carew. Up next, Professor Sheridan with another economics question. Dreamers drain the federal budget. Fact or fiction? Well, I guess that depends. Um, if you're talking about deporting the dreamers, then that would be fact, because that would cost a lot of money. So most estimates are something like seven to $21 billion um, to deport the dreamers, not to mention all of the lost future tax revenue that you would have. Um, but I think what you mean is if we pass the DREAM Act, um, would that somehow, what, what kind of budgetary impact would that have? Um, there the answer I think is, is a little bit more uncertain um, in terms of just the federal budget. So the CBO, the Congressional Budget, Op uh, uh, Congressional budget Office, they do um, these projections where they, they do 10-year projections on what different programs would cost. Um, one estimate that they looked at a couple years ago uh, put the net impact of the, the DREAM Act at around $1.3 in the positive. Um, and then a study they did last year was about $26 billion in the negative, and that's over a 10-year time period. So if you think about $26 billion uh, for a government that spends trillions of dollars annually, that to me seems like what I would call not much effect. Um, not really positive, um, but not really net negative. But that's only on the budget, right? So that's solely on federal expenditures uh, that, that, would, that would come as a result of, of that act. Um, if you look at the economic impact, um, the, the DREAM Act, some of the estimates have the economic impact over um, 10 years to be something on the order of like $280, $290 billion um, just for the DREAM Act, not for wider immigration reform. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, and so, so how does this happen? Um, so you have very, little, very few studies that have actually been done on um, DACA in particular, just because it's such a relatively new program and there's not much data that are available out there. But one study um, showed that uh, the, the passage of DACA um, allowed around 50 to 75,000 immigrants um, from, uh, to go from outside the formal labor force, so um, like cash only type operations or from being unemployed to, uh, to being employed. Um, that's gonna mean they're paying more taxes and typically when they did that, their wages went up 40 to 50%. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, that that's somewhere in between fact and fiction. I think there's a little bit of truth on both sides. Um, they do cost resources, um, and it, but it depends on when they come. So high school immigrants are going to be much less of a strain on the budget, especially if they come over and they're already educated, right? So uh, one of the biggest costs that you have to educating um, undocumented persons is when they come um, as children and you have to put them through uh, public school because public school uh, costs money. But 
again, I could go on about the positive externalities that you that you maybe have there. So my answer, you know, do the dreamers drain the federal the, the, the federal budget? Generally no, but it's a little bit more ambiguous and, and you could find some evidence on both sides. Great. Thank you. Next up, Professor Reynolds, this is for you as an attorney who works with, um, with immigrants. Dreamers are unsure of their legal future right now. Fact or fiction? A fact. As my colleague already mentioned, there is legislation, there are multiple bills that are pending right now in Congress. We don't know if one or any of them are going to pass anytime soon. Um, the rescission of DACA, that was enjoined by a federal court last month in January, and DHS was required to, again, start processing renewal applications. So if people had not filed their renewal applications in the fall, they were able to file those renewal applications since January. So it is true that in the immediate future, this is unsure, um, but there's going to be another um, vote in November of 2018. So who knows what Congress will look like a year from now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we're on to our third and final round of questions or statements. So, uh, Professor Matthews, hopefully you will lead us off again. Fact or fiction, immigrants are only here for jobs. Uh, I'll push on this one again. Uh, I think there's a myriad of reasons why people come to the United States, and the push factors are, are many. Now, jobs are a primary reason, but I'll just give some examples of other things that push people towards uh, coming here and, and thinking about them again in a historical context. That's why I'm here. Um, and I'll just, for example, give the example of um, uh, Central America, and particularly El Salvador, and MS-13 that was mentioned, I think, 14 times in the State of the Union speech. Um, and the obsessive focus um, on that group allows for sort of the, um, the criminalization of an otherwise law-abiding community in the United States and obscures the role uh, that the United States has played over the years and the moral obligation we have as a nation for policies that we've followed, foreign policy we've followed abroad, uh, in the re in recent history, but also in, in not so recent history, there's a lot. Um, now, just to, to talk about MS-13, it was a, a street gang that was born in 1980s Los Angeles, uh, the Malazo de Trucha, um, that were escaping a brutal civil war going on in El Salvador in the 1980s. That the United States Reagan administration, and before that the Carter administration, but mainly the Reagan administration, had uh, funded, aided, weaponized. Um, and that uh, it, and had murdered, you know, in the very bloody civil war through what were known as death squads, uh, and were have been sorry. Estimates have suggested they committed somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the murders during that civil war, including the El Mazote massacre, a, a, a complete annihilation of, a, of, a, of an Indian village, the murder of Oscar Romero, among other among other terrible deeds. Um, you know, we have a responsibility to that in, in, in fostering that civil war. And as refugees from that civil war came to the United States. Uh, not looking for jobs, but just trying to escape uh, the deadly violence going on in El Salvador, uh, they, were, they moved into marginalized, economically isolated, segregated communities in Los Angeles where uh, the rise of criminal street gangs, was, which was a genuinely and uniquely American phenomenon, uh, where they were absorbed into that. And, um, and then uh, during the 80s, the Reagan administration began deporting them because they were not given refugee status, because to give them refugee status would suggest that we were uh, that there were gross human rights violations going on by an ally that we were supporting, funding, weaponizing, training, that sort of thing. Um, and then subsequent administrations, uh, Clinton, Bush one, Bush two, and Obama, um, all continued that deportation. And in so doing, really elevated MS-13 to a transnational gang um, as they moved between Los Angeles and El Salvador. Um, so that's you know some historical context that we should think about our responsibility. And if we want to go further back in time, we can look at Central America more generally, and particularly the states of uh, the poorest countries in the region, in the Caribbean and Central America, uh, and look at our role since the signing of the, the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, and how we, as the United States, have treated those nations more or less as colonies. I would it's the language I use in my classes um, through gunboat diplomacy and dollar diplomacy, where we have a long history of supporting dictators, quashing political movements that seek more egalitarian and social justice, that seek redistributing uh, national resources, and instead of aided dictators that uh, you know uh, hoarded money, kept kept the lands to themselves, and as a result, we have very unequal societies there. And then when democratic openings did emerge, we worked to quash them in the Cold War context through the 1950s to the 1980s. And in places like Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicar Nicaragua, those were bloody, bloody civil wars where we trained, weaponized, uh, and funded uh, 
the, the regimes that were seeking to quash democratic movements, quash social, uh, uh, a more socially just uh, economic system, attempts to, to forge one, and, um, and that committed somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the killings in those countries. Um, that's a moral responsibility we need to think about, not just thinking about whether they're coming here for jobs or not, but you know, what are the push factors there? Um, so, you know, that's one way. And I'll just, if I just go on for what, what, a little bit more, it just, it, so that's a, that's a foreign policy issue, um, you know, and, uh, and that's one context we can look at. But we can also think about economic policy. So when we hear the president say that NAFTA, everyone's taking advantage of the United States because, in, 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 through the policy of NAFTA, like nothing could be further from the truth. The United States promoted NAFTA because we knew that it benefited us. Uh, those people who promoted NAFTA in the 1990s, for the Bush administration and signed by Clinton, um, you know, sought to exploit the income gap between Mexico and the United States. It was an attempt to raise income levels in Mexico to that of the United States, but to exploit the gap between them and, and generate profit, not, not economic equality. Now, immediately after the signing of NAFTA, uh, we flooded the Mexican market, just as one example here, with it was, um, with U.S. subsidized uh, agricultural products. Let's just think of corn or pork as two examples. Um, in so doing, with, with flooding the Mexican market with cheap corn and cheap pork, we pushed out a whole bunch of rural farmers out of, out of, out of business, who went, uh, small family farms went bankrupt, companies like Smithfield uh, 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 exported millions of tons of pork to Mexico, uh, corn as well, and, uh, or other companies with corn as well, and it led to uh, a, a lot of people moving north for, for, for new opportunities, uh, for looking for, to escape this, this devastating rural poverty. Uh, you know, above and beyond that, we see that, you know, while, well, let me just say one more thing. If you look at the numbers, too, of the number of Mexicans living in the United States before and after NAFTA, it's a stark number. I think in 1990, it's something about four and a half million Mexicans were living in the United States. After the signing of NAFTA, within five years after NAFTA, that number is up to close to 10 million. And, I, you know, I think that there's a, there's a correlation there that, um, that, that numerous studies have, have, have pointed out, and I'd be willing to talk to people after if they're interested. Um, one I was going to say one more thing about that. Um, oh, also the, uh, the the building of factories along the, the free trade zone along the northern uh, border of Mexico, which which created you know created jobs temporarily uh, for Mexican workers. But those jobs very quickly evaporated. They took jobs from places like here in North Carolina, the hosiery industry, and that went to went to places like Mexico, but only for a temporary time because cheaper labor was eventually found elsewhere. So those jobs went from Mexico. They then went to Haiti. They then have gone to China and now to Bangladesh and. You know, if they find cheap labor on the moon, I'm sure they'll go up there and, and start building factories. Um, so, you know, uh, so we also have to think about the way our economic policy has affected uh, the immigration issue and why are people coming looking for jobs? You know, what's been our role in that? Um, so, you know, I think that would be, uh, you know, again, it, it's not a yes or no answer, but I just uh, one that I would want to see, one that involves high, you know, high historical contextualization. Thank you, Professor Matthews. Another economics question. <clears throat> An America first trade agenda helps protect American jobs. Fact or fiction? Uh, it depends. Um, so technically, uh, that might be true, but it, I would say, I would clarify to say it helps protect certain American jobs, um, whichever ones get the protectionist industries. Um, and it, economists in general are t t tend to be anti-trade barrier. So things like tariffs, we don't tend to like. Um, and the reason is because it, it requires you to pick a winner, essentially. Um, who are the, what are the industries that I want to help um, and what are the industries that I want to ignore? Um, so for example, um, some recent ones that have been in the news, um, the solar panel industry. I don't know if you all follow this. It's not, not really a sexy topic, but um, solar panel tariffs. 30% tariff on, um, on solar panel tariffs that are imported into the U.S. Um, but it turns out the U.S. produces very few solar panels itself, which is why they're trying to put an import tariff on it um, to help the domestic manufacturers. The vast majority of people that work um, in the uh, renewable energy sector, uh, in, specifically in the solar industry, work on installation, not manufacturing. So this, this tariff is probably going to kill like 23,000 jobs. So again, it might be good if you manufacture um, those solar panels, and you might like that, uh, but not if you're an installer, uh, which might just be um, some of that, that low-income demographic that, that those policies are meant to help. It's going to hurt. Um, 
overall, you see, um, it, you know, the manufacturing sector always gets a lot of talk when you talk about trade. Uh, we talk about offshoring jobs overseas or maybe uh, low wage competition at home. The manufacturing sector employs about 12 and a half million people. Um, that's around eight and a half percent of total population or a total uh, working um, uh, total employees in the United States. So of all the jobs that we have in the U.S., about 8.5% is in manufacturing. Doesn't mean manufacturing shouldn't matter, um, but perhaps, you know, it shouldn't dominate the conversation uh, in the way that it does. Um, I think sort of uh, carrying on my colleague's point there about um, helping uh, other economies. So if you want, like, if you, if you have sort of a, a fear of outsiders and if you want to curb immigration, a great way to do that is to help their economies develop. Um, and one way you could do that is through trade and integration of economies, not closing down walls and throwing up barriers. That, that typically doesn't make very many friends, right? Um, and so one way to curb um, immigration could be to actually help promote um, some of those other economies. So I would say, um, no, I really don't think it does a whole lot to protect American jobs. I mean, some jobs might benefit, but at the great cost of future jobs and at the cost of future innovation that maybe is, is not realized because of some of the policies. Great. Thank you, Professor Sheridan. Professor Reynolds, this term is in quotation marks. Um, <laughs> chain migration is an easy path to legal immigration. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Going back to the quotas, the wait lists, the backlogs, um, it's an incredibly lengthy process for someone who has a green card or is a U.S. citizen to sponsor particular family members, um, to sponsor a parent, a married adult child, or a sibling, you have to be a U.S. citizen. So to be a U.S. citizen, if you are not born here, to become naturalized, you have to have a green card, which we just learned how difficult that is and then have been here at least five years, English proficiency, good moral character, then become a U.S. citizen. Um, currently, there are a U.S.-born child trying to petition for legal status for their parents. They can't do so until they turn 21. So for someone who is born here and their parents are foreign-born, that child has to be nearly 31 years old before their parents have made it here, once you add the visa backlogs to that number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have one more um, fact or fiction statement for our panel, and then we're going to take questions from the audience that will be read by a student leader. Fact or fiction. Immigration attitudes are associated with racial attitudes. This is for Professor Carew. I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> We've got some time. Fact? Uh, it, it's, um, <clears throat> it's factual, right? Um, it's, it's hard to talk about this in a way that can um, ensure that individuals who may not necessarily have a, a good historical background in terms of how race and ethnicity and nationality and so forth have worked within the United States, um, how to not make it seem as though um, it's kind of a wild idea, right? Um, because in the past 50 years or so, we've worked really hard to kind of scrub the language of race um, from everything having to do with our laws, right, as we, as we should be doing, right? Um, however, what we do know is that race, ethnicity, and nationality have played a significant role in terms of our attitudes within the United States concerning immigration. Um, and, you know, unfortunately for most of the history of the United States, we have actually created a system in which um, the concept of white race and the concept of Americanness are synonymous. Um, again, this is something that we've particularly in the last 50 years tried to take out of um, our, our historical memory, but it's something that did exist um, very directly. Um, and one of the first things that um, we did as a nation in terms of creating legislation was to set up who it was that could become a citizen, right? So in 1790, we have the um, Naturalization Act that says that only individuals who are free white persons, right, are allowed to be, become naturalized citizens, right? um, And so this is kind of the beginning of that situ of situating race in um, our understanding of how immigration is supposed to work. Um, we also placed um, significant restrictions on um, immigration that were racial in nature because of the racial attitudes that we have held. 
Um, and so we've created a lot of, um, or we had created a lot of quota systems that we didn't get rid of until 1965 with the Heart Seller Act. Um, and so if you kind of take a look around the United States um, in terms of the demographics, and you take a look around the world in terms of the demographics, and you consider that people might want to move to a place where perhaps they can experience more equality of opportunity and freedom as per our core values, right? You would imagine, right, or you would think that perhaps our demographics should look more like what world demographics look like. Right? But that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because we've placed these significant restrictions in the past on places that um, have significant brown and black uh, populations. Now, um, there's again, there's a lot that I could go into here, so, but I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, in terms of this concept of racialization, uh, we often forget that many um, European ethnics were not perceived as white about 100 years ago. Right? And, and they were spoken of in the same negative racialized terms that we use now in terms of being lazy and unintelligent and dirty and prone to criminal activity and that they were rapists and so on and so forth. Right? So some of the terminology that we hear now is terminology that was quite familiar for uh, groups that we would now consider to be white. Right? Um, and so racial attitudes have been very closely connected in with the concept of scapegoating particular groups of individuals. Um, kind of moving to now, right, we're kind of still seeing it in terms of um, how racial attitudes influence people uh, with some of the birther craze back at, especially around 2011 and 2012, um, when Donald Trump, prior to being a, um, a candidate, would speak about on the, on the news about um, how he didn't believe that uh, Barack Obama was born in the United States, he also would then sometimes say, well, you know, I think, I think we need to have more immigration from Europe. Right? And so these are some of the things that were kind of being talked about together at the same time that gave a sense of where some of that sentiment um, concerning um, the, the birtherism was coming from. Uh, addition, the same thing that we kind of see in terms of the recent derogatory um, reported remarks um, from a recent meeting as compared to wanting more immigration from Norway, right? These are things that kind of get lumped in together. Now, in terms of actual studies that have examined this, we have um, pretty clear data indicating that racial attitudes are connected with attitudes on immigration in terms of anti-immigrant rhetoric, in terms of policies and in terms of just general discussion. Um, Efrem Perez um, in 2016 had a book called Unspoken Politics where he looks at implicit attitudes. Um, and there are a variety of things that he finds there. One is that um, our print and television news media focus in particular on Latino populations when they're talking about immigration. And the ways in which immigration is spoken about in that reporting is often connected to individuals lacking documentation. And so what this ends up having, and the effect this has, is to tie in our minds the concepts of immigration and people who are from Latinx communities and this idea of, quote, illegality, right? And so that sets that in our minds and influences our implicit attitudes. Uh, but then those implicit attitudes very directly influence what we think immigration policy should be. Um, and then um, a more recent, I guess they're both pretty recent, another book by uh, Zepeda Millan um, from this year actually called Latino Mass Mobilization works toward examining the ways in which racialization have, of immigrant communities has directly influenced both policy as well as mobilization of those communities around political issues. Thank you. We now have some time for questions from the audience, which will be read by our student leaders. So we have time for probably two or three questions. So there was a question um, that somebody had regarding the idea of the administration's change in negative perspective on um, immigration. Um, so it says, do you believe that the current administration is negatively painting a picture of Im immigrants or is it in line with what past presidential stances have been on immigration? And if so, do you think there are implications socially and economically? So the sort of this, this change between the current political climate and what's been in the past. 
whoever wants to take that. Well, well I'll say that, okay. um, yeah, what we're seeing now is some, I, I would think like any, like nothing else we've ever seen, um, you know, undocumented people are some of the hardest working, most industrious, risk taking people, which are all values we supposedly cherish in this nation. Um, it's also shown uh, in every peer reviewed study over and over again that uh, migrant communities commit less crime than their US born counterparts. Um, and so the, the idea of, crim of, of repeatedly trying to criminalize them through these references to things like MS-13 um, and, 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 and not recognizing our own historical role in, in, in pushing people out of their own countries through our foreign policy and our, our economic policy globally. Um, and, and considering that for the president to say things like that this new generation of refugees, of young people, of unaccompanied children escaping violence somehow pose a threat to us is, is, is uh, you know, grotesquely absurd and offensive. Um, and it's an insult to just even a basic understanding of history, so. Uh, also just, again, a lot of the rhetoric that's used um, is highly problematic here. So uh, among the many things that were mentioned in terms of some of this rhetoric from, let's say, the, the State of the Union address, um, just that line of Americans are dreamers too, right, um, was, particularly unhelpful, let's say, in terms of moving forward any sort of policy debates regarding um, figuring out how to best handle these situations, politically speaking, right? So because what it does automatically is it discounts the concept that individuals who are here without documentation are actually Americans already, right? By saying, are dreamers too, that automatically separates out these two groups, right? Dreamers as we see for individuals who are DACA recipients, and then Americans, right? And so we're already creating this us versus them uh, dynamic within this type of rhetoric, right? And so when political actors are perhaps um, using forceful language in this way or just uh, differentiating language in this way, it um, becomes concerning in terms of the development of policy because um, on one hand, individuals are saying, well, we need to move forward on this, but then it seems a bit disingenuous when that sort of rhetoric is, is used. And it's subtle, it doesn't sound like it should be a problem, but when you, when you kind of peel it away and examine it more directly, and think about how um, it influences people kind of at a, at a base level, then it, it is this differentiation. Yeah. I'd like to add one thing, I think, um Definitely the rhetoric has changed now that there is a big wave of support for dreamers. Um, there, there's less of an inclination to be anti-undocumented immigrant and now there's this actual policy-wise attack on what has been legal immigration before. So we're seeing humanitarian forms of immigration be slashed. In fiscal year 2016, the U.S. accepted 85,000 refugees for resettlement. In this fiscal year that will end on September 30th, we might make it to 22,000. So um, I think that there's, now that there's being more support of some of the people who are already here and have proved themselves to be American, now we're hearing phrases like chain migration, which is just a nasty way to say family unification, which has been the basis of a large part of the people who have come here as immigrants that have become permanent residents and citizens. So I think um, as there's been more rhetoric about build the wall and everything and seeing how actually logistically not possible that is, there has been an attack instead on these legal forms of immigration such as um, temporary protected status not being renewed for most of the nationalities that currently have it. Next question from the Our audience. Our second question is, what is the difference between DACA and the DREAM Act? Le legally? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, legally speaking, um, DACA was an executive action. So the executive branch, you know, our lovely separation of powers that we have in the United States, the executive branch has the power to enforce or not enforce certain regulations. So as my colleague did mention before, it's sort of going to the back of the deportation line. So even though someone might be here without legal immigration status, they're not being prioritized for removal from the United States. 
And the DREAM Act is a per would be a permanent legislative fix that would become a part of our Immigration and Nationality Act. Right, exactly. And, and um, to just expand on that, right, um, in terms of ex executive power, um, you're, you're in place as the executive to enforce the laws of the land, right? And so the DACA allows for some sort of um, engagement with that concept of enforcing the laws, but making decisions about exactly how they get enforced within the letter of the law, whereas changing the laws altogether with, say, a DREAM Act would then allow for um, some sort of movement toward determining actual legal status or citizenship status and so forth which DACA does not do, right? So people who are DACA recipients are still highly up in the air, right? Um, and many people were concerned about signing up for DACA because they were not sure about what was going to happen politically speaking within the next few years, and those um, concerns did come to fruition, right? And because all of their family information is now in the hands of the government. Thank you. Our last question is, as Elon students, what can we do now? Which is a good segue to our last slide. And um, so Immigrant Realities is a group of students that has been working and creating these panels. And aside from that, we have an Instagram where we'll be posting more information on misconceptions. And you can follow us there, as well as on Facebook. If you would like to be part of this group of students, you can email us to everydreamcountseu at gmail.com. Um, you could also join LHU, which is the Latinx Hispanic organization on campus. And El Centro has different opportunities for you to continue getting informed on topics related to this issue as well. Um, Hall for Change is also accepting applications now, so if you would like to be part of different social justice issues, um, then you can apply and email abelfer at elon.edu. So if you want to help us continue creating events like this, please follow us and also email us so that you can be part of the email list. And maybe repeat the question one more time for our panelists <laughs> and audience. The last question? Yes, the last oh. question. As Elon students, what can we do now? Okay, um, so I'm gonna take a risk here um, as, a, as a white male um, to say this. Um, try and like talk to people and be friends with people that don't look like you. Um, so when I was growing up, I came from rural Kentucky, um, probably 95% white. Um, you can see how they voted in the last election, and so that was sort of my, the echo chamber that I lived in um, until I got to college. And when you get to college, you get to meet people that are new and different from you. And so if nothing else, um, these would obviously be great steps to take, but um, if nothing else, just talk to people that are different than you and don't think that they you know, instinctively harbor any ill intent towards you. Just get to know people and then, um, you know, and then read uh, about these things online too. Read things that you don't maybe agree with just so that you're informed about maybe what another side says. Um, so just, I, I, that would be my plea, I guess, is just to, to try and be more outgoing and talk to people that, that aren't like you. And, and kind of coming off of that um, reading aspect, engage in, in research, right? Um, you have access to library resources that many people do not have access to, right? So you are in this great position of privilege, right, where you can actually find data. Um, you can find charts that will give you a lot of information that other people don't have access to. And so by becoming more informed, right, you can then begin to determine where to move next, right? Because if you don't know something, then you don't have a basis for, for your action. And I, I'll add to that, you know, read history. Uh, read more, uh, get historically informed, Look, think about the context of our government's foreign policy, uh, our behavior abroad, both now and in the past, and think about whether we have a moral responsibility uh, for refugee crises that are happening around the world, not only from coming from Latin America, but a refugee crises, which is you know, which is buffering, uh, which is uh, you know, blasting Europe right now. Um, 
uh, and think about, you know, what are the causes for that? You know, or think about our policies of war in the Middle East that have created a refugee crisis, our policies in Latin America that have caused refugee crises. You know, we, we need to think about our own moral role and understand the historical context and not sort of fall for facile claims uh, that, that, um, that make these issues uh, black and white and, and overly simplify and that demonize um, already marginalized groups. Register to vote. Um, you have the opportunity to email, tweet at, call, Facebook stalk your representatives in Congress, in the Senate, in the State House in Raleigh. If you are from someplace very far away from Elon, you can even write an op-ed and send it home to your local newspaper for your parents to read. Uh, just you, like you, we said, you have so many opportunities here as a university student to educate yourselves and you should use that to amplify the voices of those who have been marginalized. Follow up on that one informational resource you have mm -hmm. at Elon is um, Elon does try to assist students with voter registration and you can access that at elon.edu slash vote for more information there. Let's have a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>